Morning, everybody. Thanks for coming out to my talk today. We're going to dive into how to build a sequel for mobile games and uh, what we went through with our Killshot series up in Vancouver. Uh, a little bit about me first. I've been doing games for just over 17 years. Spent a decade in console before coming over to Hothead. Uh, I was a creator of the Big Win Sports series and now oversee all games at Hothead from a creative standpoint, uh, including the Killshot games we'll talk about here today. Uh, a bit more about Hothead. We're two studios big. Uh, about 150 people up in Vancouver, and then a couple years ago we opened a studio on the east coast of Canada, so two places that couldn't be any further apart. Uh, we do get to see both oceans, and we got uh, 30 people out in Halifax, and they're working on their own product right now, and they've been a, a great addition to the company. But we're here today to talk about sequels and how to get them done. Uh, the talk is broken down into three different uh, segments. We have why sequel, and we'll talk about sequel strategies, and finally end up with uh, sequel safety. Uh, so why SQL? Um, and the story starts off a little bit interesting because we started out when we created Killshot with a game that was really well received. Uh, it came out, it actually took us by storm in terms of how well it actually performed. Uh, we managed to get inside the top 50 grossing games right away, actually penetrated the top 20 grossing games right away. So we had something that was really magical compared to what we had come from on mobile. And so you're saying, well, well how does this talk about a sequel then? Well, the one key thing early on that really led us to sequeling this game was the fact that we weren't experts in live operations or updates. Uh, historically, with our big win games, and we had a previous military series called Rivals at War, coming from console, we had, we had not really had the experience of what it takes to create new content and, and what type of cadence that content needs to be created with. Um, we were just learning things about A-B testing. Uh, we, were, we were using other people's analytics platforms and really didn't understand what we were looking at. So these things really led us to understand that while making a game is, is one aspect of the challenge, you have to understand how to keep that game functioning over time. So we needed to gather some experience and updates in live operations. Because we didn't have that experience, what we saw over time was, well, the game launched very well and people responded well to it, great star reviews, uh, players liked it, performance was good. Six months in, we started to see the game trending off. And then a full calendar year later, the game had gone from being a top grossing game to now starting to trend out of the top 200 games in the US. So you go from launching something really great to seeing it trend out in a year, that's a bit too quick. Um, and that's something that we had to take a step back and understand what was going on. We created a game that people loved right away. They came along with us, but then we had this problem of players just falling off and dropping out. So we took a step back and we had to understand what was the reason for this? Why is it that we weren't able to keep people longer than a year? Um, we looked at player reviews. We, we spent a lot of time looking at the marketplace and understanding what was going on and the other products that were out there and identified issues with our economy. We identified issues with the fact that we didn't really have enough to keep players interested over time. So we quickly realized we had something that people liked, but we didn't have something that could keep people. So we had to quickly turn and try to sequel this game to win that audience back and continue to build upon the success that was there. We couldn't do it in the game we currently had because simply too many people had left the product at that point in time. Uh, so that leads into sequel strategies and what we did with Killshot Bravo, which was the game that came out not too long after Killshot had been uh, launched, coming gone through its cycle. Um, the first thing we wanted to do was leverage the brand. We knew we had something that players responded to. We created a first-person military shooter um, military games, as we knew coming from console, was something that really stretched worldwide, and we saw that response in Killshot. So while we had players that were happy with Killshot, what we wanted to do was make sure we took the brand that we created and leveraged that as best as possible with Killshot Bravo. That audience that came to our game initially, we needed to make sure that when the sequel came out, that they knew they were getting the same game that they got the first time, plus a whole lot more. So to sh show some of that, what I wanted to do now was show the trailer for Killshot and then the trailer for Killshot Bravo to show the similarities between the two and how we use that to really take that initial audience and try to win them back.
Okay, so that's kill shot. Now we'll quickly go across to kill shot Bravo. So as you can see from the two trailers, the, we had the sniper gameplay was something that was in the first one that we brought over to the second one. The kill shot, the slow motion bullet cam, uh, kill cam at the end was something that our players really wanted, so we had to make sure that was there. The position of power, one versus many, that was there. And then in the sequel, you started to see new things that players didn't see in the first one. Traveling on vehicles, um, uh, moving with a group of players, up close and personal modes, expanding the game, showing people that what they came to expect from the first one was in the sequel, but a whole lot more. So while we maintained the brand, and we also had to figure out what goes into the box for the sequel. How do we take a game and bring it out and make it bigger, better, badder, and have it last a lot longer? So the first thing was designed around the missed opportunities. So a few slides ago, we saw the players falling into a chasm, and we had understood that there were opportunities with the economy that we needed to expand. We had an itemized economy, which has limited purchase ceilings. So we looked at adding gotcha mechanics to our game to further expand out the spend opportunity. We had researched and understood that social was something that was growing in the mobile space and was something that could be an end game for players. So we focused on making the first social shooter uh, that was out on mobile. And while new ideas help to propel a game forward, you also have to make sure you retain what worked the first time around. A lot of sequels fail in games historically because they fail to bring forward what worked in the first one. So we had to bring the same type of action puzzle gameplay that Killshot worked on the first time into the sequel. People have an expectation in a sequel that it's going to deliver on what the first game offered. That's a really important thing to remember if you're going to sequel something because it's something you can easily miss. You can get excited about new things, leave the old stuff behind, and have a recipe that while you ticked off new boxes, you didn't deliver on the experience that people loved the first time around. If you ensure you do these things, you're going to have that success. We've had it with Killshot Bravo, uh, and that's been the real combination that's helped us sustain a game now that will be going into its third year in the fall, and we hope it's going to last for a number of years past this, uh, uh, this next one coming. To go along with that, a couple things to remember as well are while you want to build a game that's going to be fun at launch, the important thing is to design something that's going to last for years to come. With Killshot, we didn't do that, and when a year had come and gone, the product had already trended down. So with Bravo, we took a step back and said, we have to design something now that's going to last for many years to come. In fact, at Hothead now, we only target games that are going to last four or five years and beyond. So think about that right away. What is the end game? What is the long-term game for, uh, plan for your players? How are you going to keep them interested over time? If you design that too late, your players will easily go on to something else. So make sure you're thinking about that from day one and it's that way you're taking care of your players for many years to come once the game is successful. The last part of the talk is sequel safety, and these are just some things that we ran into that you may want to watch out for if you do have to sequel a product. The first step being that you will cannibalize your first product, so be ready. Um, when we launched Kill, uh, Killshot Bravo, we had an audience that was still playing Killshot, even though it had trended down. But of course, when something new and shiny comes out, you're going to see players move from one game to the other. And we quickly saw this migration take place. So while Killshot was trending down, it still had uh, meaningful revenue to bring to the company. The important thing for us to learn here, though, was that players will trend to the new product, which was what we were hoping for anyway. Um, the second thing is don't be shy about trying to move players across to the sequel. Um, if that's where you're going to be spending your time, if that's where you're going to be spending your money, investing time trying to sustain that product for years to come, you don't want people playing the old game. We didn't want people playing Killshot anymore. So we actually uh, took the action of marketing inside of Killshot to move people across into Killshot Bravo, and I'll show you that in a second. While you may make all the best efforts to move people across, some players are stubborn. Um, we know players can invest lots of money playing uh, mobile games. They're very habitual. There's something people do daily. We still have players today that are playing Killshot and have not moved across to Killshot Bravo. So while you may, may make the best effort to move players across, not everybody is going to come with you. 
Um, this is a, an example here. It's kind of funny when we're putting the slides together because our character being military themed is kind of camouflaged in. It's something we could probably go back and make a little bit better. But up here in the uh, upper left corner of the screen, we have a persistent icon of Killshot Bravo with new game underneath it. And this is always there so that if somebody does download Killshot, we have something in the game that will give us the opportunity to push them across into the new game. Because again, we're not spending as much time and energy here. We are still updating this game, but we want people to move across. Um, one other thing we have in Killshot today is when people finish the tutorial, we pop up this interstitial, which lets them know that there's a better version of the game that's out there. And with these efforts, what we've been able to do is convert 14% of people from here across into the new game. So it's quite successful in terms of making sure those players come across and we can continue testing more creatives making this better over time the point is when you have two games you want people across uh, do what you can to, to ensure they come with you um, to go along with sequels and, and part of cro uh, pro uh, doing cr cross promo you're going to have confusion in the marketplace players will inevitably download the wrong game if, if People are talking, say, hey, I played this great game, Killshot Bravo. They're going to go to the store. They probably type in Killshot. Both games are going to come up. They're not quite sure which game it is. They'll, they'll, they'll end up downloading Killshot again. Those marketing uh, interstitial things we have in the game help move people across. But you will uh, have some confusion if both games remain out there. Um, and the other thing is you're going to have two games you have to support. So for us, what we ended up doing to circumvent this was we made the live operations on Killshot automated. We created scripting systems that allowed us to plan events and sales three to six months out. We still have to go back and update those scripts every once in a while to ensure that there's uh, things being done to the game. But even though that game is not our focus, we thought it was important to have good faith with the players and ensure that we're still doing something uh, to keep that audience appeased and then allow us to really focus on building Killshot Bravo out and, and putting more uh, meat on the bone with that game. So if you have those two games that are there, you now have to be ready to support two products. Um, so some closing thoughts. Build a game that can last for years. You really have to plan for day 1000 right away. I can't stress that enough. If you don't, you will see your game die a lot quicker uh, than what you want it to. Um, to go along with that, make sure you take time to learn what it takes to run live operations. We kind of took for granted and didn't really understand it at the time, and now we've built out our own analytics platform, our own A-B testing, and we understand what it takes to build a game and maintain it for years to come. The fact that I'm up here talking and Killshot Bravo is about to go into its third year is a testament to that growth in our company. So if you're not quite there with that in your company today, make that a focus because it will be the key uh, to ensuring that a game can last a long period of time. And while this talk is on sequels, we often talk about the best sequel being one that you never need to build. Um, if we could have just sustained Killshot, we wouldn't have had the risk of having to build a second game because when you build a second game, you may get the recipe wrong. Competition could come in and sweep, sweep your feet out from under you if you're not paying attention. So the idea is build a game be ready to have it last forever, and hopefully you don't have to worry about sequeling the game and, and taking that risk on at hand. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for, for listening, and now I'm happy to use the rest of the time to answer any questions. I like what you say about, <clears throat> about the day 1000, but I was wondering if you could give more details about what you did at day zero to make sure that you'd be viable at day 1000. Sorry, the, sorry, what we did at day zero? At day zero, at launch, to, to, to ensure that you'd be viable at day 1,000. Well, I think, I mean, with, with every game, early performance is, is really important. So focusing on having a really successful tutorial. Uh, day zero is, is the day where you're going to define whether players are going to actually stay and play with you. So having something that allows players to get into the game uh, they need to get a taste of the game. They need to understand how to play your game. We talk about uh, user experience a lot up at Hothead. And it's not just understanding uh, what to do, but why they're doing it and what's motivating them. So um, getting a good tutorial, making sure that you're um, unlocking modes and ways to play at the correct points in time. And you kind of have to lead a horse to water. There's a lot of new people playing games today, especially in the Western markets, that have never, you know, I, I grew up playing games, so I'm going to date myself, but I've been doing this for 37 years playing video games. A lot of people that are doing it for the first time. So making sure they understand what they're playing, 
why they're playing, and what's motivating them to come back the next day. Those are three things that I think all game developers should be looking at to give you a chance to get to day 1,000. Once they get into that curriculum and that cycle and they understand what they're doing and why, and they've created a habit, you're going to have them. So now you just have to make sure that something new is thrust into the game every so often, and they can see what they're building to. They can see what's going to attract them back over time. But if you don't get them into the cycle early, you, you'll lose a lot of players quicker, and day 1,000 won't even come into play uh, for many of those players. And then you mentioned uh, new content. Was there anything that you thought worked well, and conversely, anything that worked that didn't work that you could share? So for us, with the Killshot series, it's an itemized economy, and so what that means is players were buying guns off a shelf. And so essentially, each month, we needed to create new gameplay with new weapons connected to that gameplay to ensure that we had the opportunity to re-monetize players. So that was one of the main update cadence for us, was um, figuring out how often do we need to put new content in. If you have an economy that's more gotcha inspired, you probably have a bit more runway to play with because players aren't able to acquire exactly what they want uh, at, at every single purchase point. So it really comes down to the game. But in, in Bravo, it was really about ensuring we have enough weapons on the shelf. It wasn't that people didn't want to buy weapons. We would often sell out the store very quickly. So we had to figure out how, how often do we have to put guns back into the store to give ourselves a chance to re-monetize players. Great, thanks. You're welcome. So uh, I thought you made some really good points about like what happens when you sequel, like with the market confusion and whatnot. So you've obviously addressed a lot of the shortcomings that you had in your first title in terms of your being able to actually run your product as a service, which is why it's sustaining itself after three years. Do you, do you think that there would ever be a situation in which you would actually sequel again, essentially, at this point now that you have live ops more under control? I think it's, I mean, with, with Bravo, we would have to see the game trend down over time. I mean, every game may have a, a life expectancy. Um, certain, the, the graphic level could change. It could be numerous things in the market that shift Bravo and, and make it unappealing over time. So if the game started to trend down naturally, we just saw players decoupling from it, then looking at, is there now opportunity to rebuild again and come out with something bigger and better? That's really strategically what we've talked about at this point in time. Currently, the audience, the engaged audience we have has not shown any signs of that. So again, because the game has been out longer, the investment from some players is even higher than what it was in the first one. Hitting reset, uh, especially when we went from Killshot to Killshot Bravo, Players in Killshot were like, are you going to support this game anymore? Because if they've already invested a, a fair high dollar amount, they're going to get worried that now that investment is going to be gone. So I'd say the answer to your question is, if Bravo started to trend down naturally and look like it was not going to be profitable anymore, we would consider it at that point in time. But currently, right now, um, we're focusing on trying to sustain that and listening to the community and doing everything in our power to keep that game part of their daily habits. Cool, thank you. Uh, I, got, I got a quick one for you. So, you know, from a developer perspective, it's obviously very appealing to release a sequel, given that you know you have your art assets and your mechanics and a lot of your technology built, and you're improving on that rather than starting from scratch. I was wondering if you could speak to how important uh, the maintaining the same team and the same sort of uh, you know the, the more personal element to that is in, in terms of ensuring that sequel success. Yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, you know, as you, as you build new games and, and you have teams with different experiences, you, you inevitably will start moving people off. So the transfer of knowledge is, is huge. Um, the team that's running Killshot Bravo right now, you know, we, we do talk about plans where there could be a new game where we want to say move the lead designer off of the live ops team. What happens? That creates a massive uh, deficiency. So avoiding single points of failure is something we talk about a lot at Hothead. It's an easy trap to get into because things are rolling along. Uh, we often use the term, if somebody got hit by a bus, what would we do? Um, so we've, we've really been succession planning as a way to circumvent that and make sure that everything is written down. Uh, we were, when I joined the company, we were 30 people big. We're, we're on the cusp of 200 now. So it's easy to get into a trap too where you don't write things down. Then if somebody leaves or changes teams, you're left scratching your head trying to figure out, well, what were we doing to maintain such a good update cadence? So write things down, don't have single points of failure and transfer knowledge, and, and you should be able to maintain anything that's working successful at your company. Good to hear you're aware of bus factor. It's too many companies that aren't. <laughs> uh, I was wondering if you guys have explored using procedural content generation to prolong the life of your, your mobile games and what your findings have been with that. 
Yeah, yeah, we have uh, seasonal has been actually a really big part of uh, Kill Shot Bravo. It was funny too because initially we weren't sure how our audience would respond to it. it it's a very uh, mature military theme. I mean, you've got arterial spray and, and nasty headshots, and it's not uh, it's not trying to to make light of itself. But we did dabble in it. And we've had. Uh, random things like rabbit heads that you can put on your avatar at Easter, chocolate rabbit heads. We do holiday crates now uh, with every season that comes around and uh, recently with the 4th of July, uh, different weapons that f uh, shot out fireworks in the kill shot. So when you kill the guy, you're treated to a, a beautiful fireworks explosion. We've had really good response to it. So what was interesting for us is that we thought we had an ultra serious military crowd and I think that seasonal stuff uh, for any player I think that's staying with the game for a long period of time it changes up the the content changes up the tone and people generally feel pretty good around holidays so I think it's a it's definitely an opportunity that I think any game can exploit and take advantage of and yeah we've had great success with it so far in a game that we weren't really sure how how people were going to respond great thank you I really enjoyed your talk by the way thanks awesome well thank you so much Mike that's all the time we have big round of applause please awesome. for Mike thank Gore. you